people to uh, believe and repent and confess and then be baptized. So that's, wait a minute, that's, that's not what I thought. That's not what it can't be all about. That's the power of God's word today in order for us to be saved like he was from his leprosy. But still, people don't believe that. And some, there's, there are people here that may not believe that. And there are people here that have believed that and done, taken those steps. And they are saved. A rich man, uh, the rich man didn't think God's written word was adequate in the New Testament also. We'll take one example of that. And that rich man is the one in Luke 16, 20, starting in verse 27. And this rich man had died, and of course, rich man and Lazarus is a story. There was a beggar, and there was a rich man, and the rich man died and went to torment, and Lazarus died and went to Abraham's bosom. And that's where we pick it up. And the rich man is in there, in torment, and... Even a drop of water he prays for to be put on his tongue to give him some relief and that's not going to happen. So that's where he is. And then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. So he, was, he told the rich man that, no, you have to listen to God's word, the written word of God that they had at that particular time. And they also, he also mentioned the prophets, the people that spoke the word of God at that time. But by that time, Moses' law was written, so he could read it. And he says, well, if somebody comes back from the dead, and in this day and age, right now, we have Moses', the prophets, all of the Old Testament, we have the New Testament that speaks of a man rising from the dead. And we know that there are still people that turn away. But the power of God's uh, word can change even those hearts. I'm a perfect example of that. So we have also in this day and age uh, prevalent attitudes that prove the, the uh, old and new uh, New Testament examples that there is power in God's word. We spoke of that when we had our reading. It tells us in Hebrews 4.12 that is a powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It can divide asunder the soul and the spirit. It can separate those things. It's spoken at the right time to the right person. So what would be my call to all of us in this room is to go ahead and speak these words and to tell people the, uh, the good news. Every once in a while, pop, pop up a, a question, like we're told, is to throw out that seed. And if it goes on the rocky place, if it goes on the good soil, we don't know what that person is. We may think that they are the rocky and they are, this is never going to go anywhere past this thick skin. But we know through these readings that we've had here that the power of God's word has the power to save those that have the right heart. And if they, they may not have the right heart at the particular time, you speak the words to them, but it can divide asunder soul and spirit maybe at a later time. So that's our, that's our call to uh, take God's word and to put it out there. Some have said that uh, sinners are incapable of receiving the word of God, and this is some of that religious uh, error that we have, unless they have the direct operation of the Holy Spirit to change their heart. So there's a big belief going around about that, that you have to have the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. I've talked to religious people who believe that, and uh, otherwise you just won't understand it. People can't understand by reading. They can't take the Word of God, read it, and then understand what he's saying and come to the realization that they need to be saved 
by those steps we spoke of, of believing and repenting and being baptized. Because uh, they have to have the direct operation of the Holy Spirit to touch them in some miraculous way, open their eyes, and all that. And we, we just had a really uh, world-famous, uh, you know, religious man that passed away that did just that. He would have stadiums full of people for since the 50s up until, I don't know, maybe his son can, carries on the tradition where he would have people speak words and say, I'm a sinner, come into my heart and change me, make me, you know, your child, save me, and I will go about my business. And, and he did that for, you know, 50 years. And that, as we find in the uh, power of God's word, that is not the way it happens. But there are people out there. Hopefully, we can speak to some of those people that may, be, may believe that type of... Uh, that type of plan, so to speak, and uh, change their heart through the power of God's word. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 13-15, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So even in that statement there, it's not the miraculous changing of your heart by the, by the Holy Spirit. It is, you are chosen from the beginning that, this, that people have this opportunity. And through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, you do have a responsibility, and it tells us that right here, that we have to believe the things that we're told by God. And it says in verse 14, Whereunto he called you by our gospel, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold the, the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So however you hear God's power and his word, you need to hold on to that and use that in your life and direct that, that power toward others. And we also have... Uh, some beliefs that some say that the Bible's out of date. I've heard that spoken before. That uh, it's you know it's a good guide. It's a it's it's a good thing you can study today, and that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. But it doesn't have any uh, uh, bearing today, and it's an old old document, but it's got some good stuff in it. But we know in Second Timothy uh, verse three. In starting in verse 16, that it tells us a little something different. It tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, right there, it's not talking about a miraculous change. It's not talking about something that's out of date. Who here doesn't need reproof every once in a while? Doesn't need correction? Doesn't need instruction on how to do things right? And this instruction can make us perfect in God and furnish us to do the good works that God has made us to do. It tells us in other places that he's made us to do good works, not to do evil. All we have to do is search it out. And if we're not searching it out, some of you or one of you may be able to speak to somebody who doesn't even know that they're searching it out. Everyone has that empty spot, and I think it's our duty as Christians just to try to see if we can't put something in those empty spots. Everyone's searching for something. They did studies that talked about um, what do people want. They all want peace. They all want, you know, happiness. They all want comfort, security. Those are all empty, empty things that people are trying to fill with whatever the world has to offer. And if we can put a little seed in there with using God's word in some way that may touch their life in some, some direction, that might be what they choose to fill those voids in their life. It says in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So that tells us everything could be gone, but God's word and God's will will be done. All we have to do is tap into it. 
So let's explore the power of God's word to correct those in religious error. We're going to take an example of uh, in Acts, starting in verse, uh, starting in Acts 19, starting in verse 1. So this is someone who's religious. They're doing things the way they think that it should be done. They're following some sort of code like we see all around us today. There's people that have these codes. So it starts in verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So these are, for all, all purposes, Christian people. They were following what they knew and all they knew about the religious world at that time. And he said unto them, in verse 3, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul said, Well, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ. John the Baptist preached repentance, and Christ was coming, and that's all they knew, and that's all that they preached, and that's all that they taught at that time. Apparently. That's the only baptism they knew. When they heard this, that it wasn't the right way to go, it wasn't the baptism that they needed to follow, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all, men, all the men were about twelve. So these twelve men were religious, and they thought they were doing the right thing. Come to find out, they had the wrong idea about what baptism meant. Simple, simple thing like that. They were following John the Baptist's baptism, which was for repentance, for the man, for the Christ that was to come. He said, Christ has come. Now you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, not for repentance, and boom. They, they accepted it and they did it. So even religious people that are devout and believe that they're doing the right thing can be wrong. There's other examples in the Bible. This is just a little touch of these things. There are several cases of conversions in the books of Acts we're going to take a look at where people uh, were wrong, though they were very, very religious. They had strong beliefs, and they followed these beliefs. So we're going to start in uh, Acts 2, and then we'll jump around a little bit in Acts 2. Starting in verse 2. So we'll read 2 through 5 in this particular reading. And then suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So these were Jews, devout. There were people from everywhere at this particular place. They heard several languages, these miracles were happening. However, they weren't in the right, they weren't believing and doing the right things. And we jump down to, to uh, verse 9. This is the kind of the list of the type of people that were there in the crowd and the different backgrounds that they had. And this shows also the power of God's word to take this diverse group and do something with them. Here we go. In verse 9. Parthians and Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea, and Cappadocia, in Pontus, in Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in parts of Libya, and Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Pretty uh, diverse group there. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues and the wonders, wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? 
So now, they've got their attention. They're speaking to him. They're speaking the words of God. doesn't tell us exactly what they said. But they're like, what does all this mean? Wait a minute. We've come here to do something, and this is something different that we're hearing now. So we jump down to verse 36. And we find out what, what happens with this group and how the power of God's word changed them. He goes through this, this whole thing about what's happened, and he starts in 36. Uh, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? So he goes to this whole thing. If you don't know what I'm talking about, the whole thing, you have to read it. <laughs> Acts 2 tells you the rest of it, the rest of the story that I'm skipping. But they hear these things, the, the gospel that was spoken to them about Christ and what, what they're doing there, and they had another idea when they got there. When they heard this, they said, wow, we've done something wrong. We are these ones. We are these people that, uh, that did this to Christ. And they said, what shall we do? And here's what the, the simple thing that they were told. And these people were very religious. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And why is that, Paul? He, or Peter, he says, For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many were other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And when they had gladly received his word, were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers." And then that, that's what happened. Signs and wonders continued, and they went about 3,000. Can you imagine if this, uh, this particular person I spoke of earlier had this stadium, and he says, okay, who wants to do this? You need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. Come on down. We have all day. How many people would run down out of the stadium and take the time waiting for 3,000 people to be baptized? There's only like 12 apostles or 12, 12 men here speaking. 3,000. And they didn't care how long it took. They did, we don't know where, where this body of water was, but 3,000 of them were baptized. We know what baptized means, to be immersed. So the idea that's, that people would do that and have that, take that time, because obviously we're busy, you know. I can't do this all night until midnight, or you guys would be nodding off. But that's what, that's what always amazed me was that 3,000 people took the time to be baptized and the other people stayed and, and, and participated. That would be amazing. But the point is, religious error can be changed from every different background of people. We've got a list of 20 different types of people here that all got together for one reason and they found out that the power of God's words, words changed their heart and they became Christians at that time. We also see the, uh, in Acts 8, there was a eunuch that was uh, baptized. He was sitting reading in his chariot, Isaiah. Somebody came up, Philip, I think it was, came up to him and says, hey, what are you doing? He goes, I'm reading. He goes, but I don't know what this guy's saying. Nobody's told me. He goes, well, I'll tell you. He tells him about what, what, uh, what he's reading, and then they go on their way. Wow, this is so cool. And they're driving along, and whatever he told him about the gospel and what he needed to do, it had to be very similar to what we read here in Acts 2, where they had to repent and be baptized. Because he saw a body of water, which they weren't around when he spoke these words to him. And he says, what stops me from being baptized? And he says, nothing. If you believe with all your heart, then you can be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and all the rest of it. And be saved, basically. And he says, I want to do it. I believe. Boom. That's another example of someone changing their heart. That, that, that's some rich guy who was in charge of, he was, a, I guess, the accountant. 
Then we also have Cornelius. He was a very religious man. He gave alms to the Jews. He was a Gentile, apparently, from the Italian band and all that sort of stuff. And he also heard the word of God, spoken to him, the gospel, the good news. And obviously, him and his household heard these words spoken to him. We don't know exactly what was said, but it has to be very similar, like I said, to what we see at the of Pentecost, because it moved him and his household to be baptized. So there's just a couple of examples about these religious men that were in error or that were missing something in their life that prevented them from being saved. And they changed it. Also in Acts 19, we're going to go there right now. Always, always love Josh. He would... Uh, he could spin through his Bible and find this stuff like nobody's business. Because I've seen him do, you know, do that, and, but not me. I got the electronic thing where I push, push, and it goes right to it. So if you're wondering what I'm doing, that's it. I can't. My wife does all that Bible searching. Anyways, here we go. In Acts 19, the disciples, the 12 disciples that were baptized that we had John's baptized, baptism and went into the baptism, the correct baptism, and changed their ways, they're mentioned in Acts 19, starting in verse 1. And it came to pass, while Apollos and Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding the certain disciples, these are some of those men. And then we find out, he, he baptized them for repentance, saying unto them, this is verse 4, that they should believe on him that should come after him. That was their baptism. And then they also became saved. So it really doesn't matter what you believe uh, at the time you hear the truth because you can change your mind. Now Paul, with these 12 men, he could have said, you know what, as long as you're a good and honest person, everybody's heard that story before, if you've been around at all. As long as you're a good and honest person, then you can, and you have a good heart, you can be saved. Well, we know that that's not the case, because there's certain things that we must do. Because in all these cases of, uh, of conversions, no matter where they were in their life and what they believed, there was things that they had to do. And that's the same case for us today. There's things that you must do. And in, uh, let's see, Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's just a little blurb that tells us, hey, you may think you're right, but if you're not following what God's word is and his power, then it will probably lead to death. Just a little warning there. He could have said that truth is relative. We've heard that before. We can't really know what is right and wrong. You know, you get those people that are skating in between the world and some sort of religion, and they say, well, it's really, truth is relative. What, what can we believe? And you have all these conspiracy theorists that go and say, well, you know what, the Catholics changed it way back then. And then there was, they, they know enough history to know that there was a group of men that got together and decided what, Bibles, what uh, Bible books would stay and go and all these sort of things. And they build a whole case on that. And they say you can't know what's right and wrong. But if you, know, if you believe God's word, that he created the universe way back in Genesis, that he spoke it into, into existence, then you're not going to have trouble understanding that he can take evil men and use them for his purposes. So if this synod in 1600, whatever, decided to take some of these books out and form the Bible that we have the way it is today, then who's to, not to know that God had a hand in that? We know that Pharaoh was an evil person. We know that, you know, the list can go on and on and on of evil men. Ahab, Jezebel, he used them in his plan to make what we have today and the things that we know and learn. So it's not a difficult thing. So that's what I would say to these people, that God is all-powerful. He can make use and take any situation he wants to make his plan work. We know 
Paul did not speak in this way. He didn't tell people, it's relative, you know, we won't know the truth. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. We also read in Acts 26, starting in verse 9, I barely thought, and then this is Paul, the things that he did, he was obviously super religious, and we're going to find some of that out. I thought that myself, with myself, that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they, had, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and be exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So he would, get, he would get letters that said he could go anywhere he wanted and gather people up, throw them in prison, have them killed. And it goes on and on and on. And Paul did all these things. So obviously somebody that religious is never going to change and do a 180 and, and start preaching uh, for Jesus Christ and, and do the will of God in that way. So we know that that would never happen because this guy is so far off. He's a murderer. He's killing Christians. There's no way. And we learn later on, after he became blind, he went to that uh, prophet that God sent, and the guy's like, I don't want to go talk to this guy, Paul. He's the one that kills Christians. We heard about him in Jerusalem. But we know also the rest of the story is that his eyes were opened and then turned them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. And that's what happened to Paul. So if that can happen to a person like that, we should not be afraid to talk to, uh, I guess you could say, evil people. I was once an evil person and somebody spoke to me and it, uh, here I am, 20, 25 years later, speaking to you. So, if there's, you know, there's help right there. I mean, there's hope right there for anybody. We know a man cannot direct his own steps in that realm, in the religious realm, because way back in Jeremiah, it says in 1023, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. So there's a plain and simple, hey, you can't do it on your own. So if you don't believe, uh, if you like the Old Testament, you want to get some wisdom from there, it tells you right there, you can't do it yourself. It tells you in a million places in the Bible that there's only one, one God, who think it's in Ephesians, one God, one baptism, one Lord, one Jesus, all the rest of that. When, re when men retain not God in their knowledge, they become superstitious. So then you have all those superstitious people professing themselves to be wise. And it says in uh, Romans uh, 1, 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man to birds and forfeited beasts and creeping things. Well, we don't do that today. Obviously, we're not worshiping, well, we don't in this country anyways. You know, animals and birds and frogs and all the stuff, cats and all that sort of butt, all that sort of business. But we know that God's word enlightens men. That's one thing we can know. In Ephesians 5, 14, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. So we have to look back. We have to be, we have to take a look at things, and we have to speak and think as wise people, not as fools, about what we're going to do with our life and our soul. We also know that uh, people in Ephesus burn their books of magic arts. They learned they could not accept Christ and their magic. So they heard the, the will of God. They heard the gospel preached to them. And they all, uh, you know, in this particular case, I'll read that for you. They, them shall, they themselves uh, shew of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned from God, turned to God from idols 
to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So these people had 50,000 pieces of, I think, silver. I can't remember silver. I think it was silver. And that was the worth of their, even if it was a dollar, that would be a lot of money to be burning all these expensive books just because they were preached the word of God and then they turned away and didn't just say, well, we'll just sell these to somebody else, keep the money because now we believe in God, so we're going to sell our books. No, they just burned them. I know that's, that's a hard thing to remember to try to do, but sometimes when you get the power of God and you realize what you've done, sometimes you just have to let go of the other stuff. No matter how hard it may be or how much you may feel like resisting in your own life, whatever that is, whatever turmoil or whatever that, that thing is that you have in your way, sometimes you just have to say, I just have to quit. No matter how hard it is and how bad it is, sometimes you may have a, uh, a boss who says that you need to fill out your reports this way. You need to fill out your reports and say, this money that you spent, we don't want the other people to know that at the corporate office, so you're going to put it in this column because that, that would cover it up so we don't have to report that. You go ahead and do that and then turn it in. So that might be something that you struggle with where you're like, wait a minute, that's wrong. Eh, what do I do? You know what to do. Don't. But if it makes your boss mad, oh well, you have to take the consequences because Christ... It's basically, it's not an easy thing being a Christian. There's things you must do that you don't necessarily like to do. Now, we don't talk about it. It's not all fun and games that I love everything that God wants me to do. I don't. There are things I don't like about Christianity where I go, I mean, I really wish I could do that, but I know that it's not right, but that's only my desire, and that's one of those things they talk about other places in the Bible where you battle against yourself. You battle internally about things all the time. And we don't know what they are and we're not here to figure out what everybody's internal battle is. But everybody has them in some certain way where we have to face the giant and we have to either be destroyed by it or we have to destroy it. And whatever that giant is, just remember, the power of God's word can and will, if you use it and let it, direct your steps in such a way that you can get over those things. And if that means you get a new job that pays less money, you lose a car, you have to move, you have to get a smaller place, whatever those silly things are, if that happens, and, and, you know, where, where are you going to end up? It's much better in the word, power and the word of God than in, in the way that man does. So when men resist the truth in many ways and for many reasons, and that's just some of them, that I gave you. Some could be money. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's not all evil, but all kinds of things. And some reaching after have been led astray from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So that's it. Some may be the fear of loss and prestige. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose something here if I follow God's word. But in Philippians 3.7... But what things were gained to me chose those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the ec excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. I don't know. It's hard to uh, count all the things that you have as dung if... It gets in the way of Christ. It's hard to take a look at your life and your things and what we have and say, you know what? I'm, I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing some things right that I need to, to change. That's not easy, but it's what's required if we want to be a child of God's. We have learned today that the Bible is such a force that men either believe it or they actively resist God's word. And that's, that's what you can take away. They're going to actively resist it or they're going to Go ahead and go for it. So we need to remember, God's word is able to save the souls of men. We've got plenty of examples, and there's a million other examples in the Bible that talk about the power of God's word and how it can turn people around. All you have to do is just read it. If you don't read it, 
nowadays you can listen to it on your phone. You can put it in headphones so some of those, even those fancy wireless deals stick in your ear and it's Bluetooth. You can listen to whatever you want while you're driving. You just can't text. That's all I know. My wife tried to do that to me today. You need to text Jeff. I am driving here. It's against the law. I don't know how to use your phone. Push the little black button. Hey, Jeff, we're going to be a little late. So anyways, just a side note. Yep, that's what happens. Anyways, therefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. I always love that. You know, other translations don't have superfluity of naughtiness. And what I like about this kind of stuff is you have to look it up. What does that mean, right? Anyways, don't do bad things. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. So that's the thing. We have to pull out of ourselves, step back and say, all right, I don't like what he's telling me. I can't drink, I can't smoke, I can't cuss, I can't lie, I can't cheat, I can't steal. I can't do any of this stuff. Yeah, that's right. And they're like, oh. even a little white lie, even just don't tell them I'm not here kind of stuff on the phone. All those things. And when you get into God's word, you'll start to look at those sort of things in your life. And where, where you didn't look before, you'll start to question. And then when you question, you'll start to search. And the scriptures just say, now wait a minute. If I'm not allowed to do certain things in my life, what does the power of God's word say? And then you will search it out. And that's, that's about the best way to study is to question the things that you're doing on a daily basis, whether or not they're in line with what God says to do. And then you won't know where to find it. After a while, you'll start to look, and then your questions will be answered. It's very simple. Men must receive with meekness the word. So we have to take a look at ourselves. Ultimately, they must be judged by the word. So if you don't look at yourself and search the word, one day you're going to be judged by it. So really it's a good idea to, to do these sort of things, circumspectly, so to speak. In John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. And the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And that's it. So, my advice to you is choose God's word. It has the power to save men's souls. It has the power to save anyone's souls. So once you get into it and become a Christian, you can also then tell your story and go help others. So if you have a need where you need to be baptized into Christ, I'm sure behind this curtain is the magic water that you can be baptized. I'm only kidding. That's only a Carrie Underwood song. <laughs> Must be in the water or something like that. <laughs> Anyways, if you have the need for the prayers of the saints or that you need to be baptized, you want to repent and be baptized into Christ, we can do that for you today and then you can start tapping into the power of God's word. So if there's anything you need, please come forward as we stand and sing.